んであれですけどあなるほど何から入ろうかなえー、っと直接の影響ではないけど、so, uh, uh, on his father's side、uh, there was a in, in the family was a relative who was an artist、うん、売れない画家でしたけどもあの He wasn't a successful artist, but he did have a house in Tokyo with a studio and stuff, and he would go over when he was younger and go there and see him you know, working and you know, doing artistic things. Okay, so, right when he was growing up, was when the manga boom started, when they started putting out the monthly and the weekly magazines in Japan. And he would constantly read those. However, even then, Though he was influenced by art, he never thought he wanted to be a manga artist. He more wanted to be an artist and illustrator. Daichi no manga boom no koro wa, ah, ma, just a hanesh torete masu ke ne. Daichi no manga boom no koro no yume. So, for example, the, the, when they say the, manga, the first manga boom, some of the artists that he read who he's influenced by were Gonagai,、uh, Shotaro Ishinomori, and of course Tezuka Osamu. De, itchio. 本当に漫画家になろうっていう感じになってきたのは、えー、僕が。The first time he had the inkling of possibly becoming a manga artist was after he graduated high school and he went to an、uh, art college. And that's where he started. でそこで、えー、僕は、えー、自分の師匠である。It was at that time he met、um, Studio Nue who produced m a c r o s s He met of someone from Studio Nue. 宮武和孝和孝宮武。和孝宮。宮武<笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑>そうですね。At、uh, Meiji University. And that was the first time this、uh, editor was a fan of his work, approached him and said, I think you should really think about drawing manga. The club was putting out an anthology and that he drew something for it. And that was the first time anything manga related he had、uh, written and drawn was published. Even then, he didn't think about it seriously as a profession. He just thought,、oh, it's a little diverse hobby. He can do whatever he wants. And I'm an illustrator. Yeah, it was an original creation that eventually ended up becoming. An anime. It was called Good Morning Altea. <laughs>、He、really likes、uh, food, so he thinks he probably would have become a chef. <laughs> It's kind of the same thing because you're still creating. Even when he goes to different shops and he talks to the chefs, the chefs themselves are artists that are, are creating something just like an artist would do. One thing led to another, and、uh, there were two, two, in, two separate events that led to him becoming more of a, a manga artist. The first was that he had more communication from Kadokawa Shoten, one of the bigger publishers in Japan. They were interested in his work and pursuing him more on a manga basis. And also, that the fan reaction to what he was doing. In the, in the anthology, the manga was very positive. So he was very happy that you know, both things kind of aligned at once and then he made his jump into the manga world. So the name of the magazine that he first worked at at Kadokawa was called Comic Comp. It used to be Comptique. Comic Comp. And that was where Ki Asamiya also got his debut point. Kadokawa had gathered all these different artists. So him, Asamiya Sensei, a lot of other artists who are very familiar to people now, all had, were in the same magazine and sales went through the roof. And that's what they consider a sort of the second manga boom that launched a lot of The artists who are still popular today. Once every two years, one of his major responsibilities is the creation of a new animated series. And he's never given up his illustrated roots, so he still does cover illustrations for a number of different publishers for novels. Video game character design. <laughs> yeah, again, that was easy. Yeah, video game character design also is a, something that keeps him very busy. He had worked with Sunrise before on the animated series Ryu, Ryu Night. So, in this, since he had worked with them before and he trusted them, in this case, he took a back seat and decided not necessarily to be you know, the original creator and take care of all the aspects, but to take more of a producer role. Normally, what you would, you know, a lot of the more manga artists whose works become popular are a little bit more hands off. You know, they say, all right, fine, just you know, take, take what you want. 
and they just sell the rights to their thing. But as he had a relationship with Sunrise, he didn't feel comfortable in just doing that. So he wanted to have a hand in everything from like picking the directors and picking, you know, who was going to work on it. So he had a lot of input from the, the, the creation, the choosing level, let's say. He was well aware that there's no way he, even though he wanted to be, have be very hands on in the actual production of the animation, that he knew that just time wise he was so busy it wouldn't happen. So he was happy, or you have to come to terms with yourself and realize that you have to place a lot of it in the hands of the director. But as far as you know, a lot of the, the storylines and everything that happened, was, a lot of it came from him directly. He went to about 90% of all the meetings for like once a week, just for like the scenarios of the story and stuff like that. And he would work Work with everybody to you know make sure it came out like he wanted it. Eighty percent aspect. About eighty percent of him had some kind of influence on some aspect of the creation. Okay, so he was actually created the entire world of Outlaw Star, and the, he was friends with the director. So the director knew had a familiarity with the actual world itself, and the creative people, the staff that they hired, were also briefed on that, and they were able to really create things that fit in with his vision because they had a good understanding of the universe. Something like the McDougal Brothers, he had nothing to do with the creation of those characters. Yeah, he likes it. Took a lot of influence from things like Star Wars and Star Trek, where there's big universes, but there's different people and different adventures going on in different places simultaneously. So when he created Outlaw Star, it was a Imagine it as a Chinese kind of universe, part of the Chinese universe, and then he dropped Jean, you know, non-Chinese, into that universe, and the story kind of grew around that. With Angel Lynx, he did the exact opposite. He created this entire European world, and in there he dropped the character from the Chinese world, just as a, the exact opposite of what he did with Outlaw Star. With Outlaw Star, if you analyze it, it's a, essentially a good character who's dropped into a bad world filled with pirates and gangsters and you know, all kinds of evil elements. But with Angel Lynx, he didn't want to do, just by dropping the character into the European universe, in the same thing, would just be rehashing the same thing. So he went with a completely different approach about what kind of world it was and how the character would interact with the characters that she comes in contact with in this European world. A lot of times when he creates, uh, no matter what he creates, he always looks at Star Wars and Star Trek for inspiration and tries to put himself in the shoes of the creators and the writers for those shows figure out and approach it how they would approach it. It's like how, how did they create their world and keep everything interesting and fresh? For example, you know, you had the original Star Trek and then you had the next generation. And they were basically the same because it was just a ship with a cast of characters that would travel through the space and you know, go on missions. However, he liked how they flipped it when they created DS9. It wasn't about the ship, it was about the actual station. And it was the same universe, but it was a completely different dynamic to the cast of characters and to the actual you know, universe and what it added to the Star Trek universe. One of the first projects that came about when he started the Morningstar company, and he was working with Sunrise at that point to try to create something new. And it was at that exact time, excuse me, where there was the um, kind of upheaval in the Kadokawa Shoten with the two brothers who got into the fight in it, and Kadokawa was kind of thrown into disarray, and that's when a lot of the artists suffered and were let go. And it was about the same time that Reunite, the seeds started growing in his market. So he never really had a problem with uh, Kadokawa Shoten themselves. He didn't really fight with any of the editors or never had a problem with the company like some of the other creators did. But he was able to realize that it did throw a lot of the, the comic world into a state of kind of disarray and it affected the way a lot of people worked and the way that the business worked at that point. Right around the same time that he was starting to work with Sunrise, uh, after the, all this fall, fell out, falling out with Kadokawa happened, he just happened to get a call from Sh the publisher Shueisha. And the, the person who contacted him was the, the artist, the editor, uh, Mr. Torishima, who also happened to find uh, Akira Toriyama and created, started to help with the creation of the Dragon Ball series. But Torishima-san was a fan of the works that ito -san had already done, so he really wanted to work with him. And it, at the same time, Shueisha was looking for an in with Sunrise, hoping to do something with them. So everything, that, the timing kind of worked out, so the three parties got together and formed kind of Alliance to start reunite. Mm. Sunrise. What do we want to do? And the situation was like, what do we want to do? And so <laughs> it fell on on him to kind of come up with some kind of world that they. Sunrise's promo was that. That is, they were. 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 They were.
、Uh, what Sunrise, what they, what they wanted to do was they had for 10 years been doing kind of for kids, the SD Gundam series, and had been progressing along at the same pace. What they wanted to do now was target a different age group, a little bit higher, with you know, some kind of robot thing. And Shueisha just wanted a very strong main character to inhabit that world. So that's where combining those two ideas, he was able to create the concept for Reunite.、Yeah. Mm, so it's disappointing, you know, that he had, you know, Kato gave, Kawakata gave him his first chance and he had loyalty to them, but because of the way everything went down, he was able to expand out a little bit. ただ要するに僕は割とそうやってその kind of the, the age group that he was targeting hit them but went beyond his expectations of the people who would become fans of the show、mm. of course it's a little disappointing because you like everything to you know, come out at the same time You know, two hadn't been, there was so much wrangling about the second part, you know, over the years, and he thought it was completely dead. But the fact that it came out a little bit later and, you know, became such a hit was actually a little bit helpful in, you know, getting the, keeping the property alive and the interest in Japan. Of course, you would always like to come out as soon as possible or simultaneous release, but there's various obstacles in the way, and that's not really something he has any influence over. Bandai Entertainment, of course, handles the foreign licensing for a lot of the properties, and then, you know, his creations become the victim of Bandai as to when they're going to be released over here. Never give up. You know, you, you have to have some kind of goal in mind, and you, before you reach that goal, you should always never, you know, get distracted or try to pursue yourself. If you have a dream in mind, you have to follow it. Don't just concentrate on a single aspect of drawing. You should take all aspects、uh, into into account, no matter what you're doing. I've seen so many people that. Just say, oh, I'm good at drawing faces. If they only concentrate on the face and never concentrate on the body, or they cut out certain aspects that they don't like to draw from their artwork. But to be an artist, you have to be a complete artist and do put, be good at everything. You can't just disregard certain things you don't like to draw.、Uh, especially, well, one of the other things this is a lot is people who don't like to draw backgrounds. They only like to do characters, and that's a very big hindrance in anyone's art. He always asks why, and he knows the answer is supposed to be because they think it's a pain in the ass, but they're never going to say that because they're embarrassed. No matter. What, even if you're an artist or you know, in any discipline, not just a, a manga artist, but you have to be concerned with doing everything, to, you know, following out on every aspect of your creation, be it art or be it anything else. Like if you're a, a director of a movie, even, you have to go out and you have to scout locations and you have to take, keep the whole picture, the, the, the complete big picture in mind. From the little details to the smaller details, and that's something that、uh, if you're not willing to do, you, you, you should really think about seriously being an artistic profession because you have to be 100% committed to doing everything. So, the, liking something is something that everybody does, everybody likes to do something, but to make your love or your like your profession. Is a, is a bigger step, and you have to have a hundred percent commitment, and you should never give up on, you know, once you commit yourself. He understands that you're always fans of certain things. It's like, you know, I'm a fan of Inuyasha, and he says that's great, but you should never take so much influence where if you say I'm a fan of Inuyasha, so my next series is going to be, I'm going to draw a series about a samurai cat. That's just kind of stealing, so that's wrong, <laughs> which could be cool. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> <laughs>